Before I say anything else, I have an announcement to make. I want all of you and your wives and your children and your brothers-in-law and everyone you know to resolve as of this moment that you will buy no presents for Christmas. And when I say no presents, I mean not a nail file, not a toothbrush. And I want you to tell your children as of this moment and on Christmas Day that the reason there is no Santa Claus this year is because we have lost the right by the murder of our brothers and sisters to be called a Christian nation. And until we regain that right, we cannot celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace. And I am very serious about this for two reasons. A. Morally, I think this nation should be for the foreseeable future in mourning. B. One must face the fact that this Christian nation may never have read any of the Gospels. But they do understand money. James Baldwin, 1963. Let's talk about Christmas. The word Christmas breaks down to Christ's Mass. Christ's Mass, M-A-S-S. The word Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T, Christ, breaks down from Middle English to Old English to the Greek word Christos, K-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, Christos, meaning anointed. And the word Christ further breaks down from there to the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning the anointed. Now, the word mass, M-A-S-S, comes to us from the Latin word missus, M-I-S-S-U-S, meaning to send or dismiss. And from that Latin word, we go to the late Latin word missa or misa, M-I-S-S-A. And from there, we go to the vulgar Latin word messa, M-E-S-S-A, meaning dismissal at the end of a religious service. And from the vulgar Latin, we go to the old Old English word spelled M-A-E-S-S-E. And from that Old English word, we go to the Middle English word Mass, M-A-S-S, meaning feast day. So in the traditional or orthodox Catholic or universal religious tradition, the word Christmas is a feast day for the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. Let's talk about a legend, brothers and sisters. Let's talk about a legend. You know, people are often referred to as legends because over time, there are many famous and sometimes infamous stories told about them. So settle into this with me, if you will. The word legend is defined as a traditional story sometimes popularly regarded as historical but unauthenticated. Historical but unauthenticated, meaning that we don't really know if all of it's true, but we do know that this person lived. I'm sure you can think about some living people and some stories that we've heard about them. We don't know if all the details are true, but we definitely know that this person exists and existed. So a legend is a myth. It's a saga. It's a, an epic. It's a tale. It's a story. It's a fable. And I want to begin this story on the Mediterranean coast of what is now known as the modern country of Turkey. So let's throw it back to a small harbor town there known in antiquity as Patara, P-A-T-A-R-A. Patara, a city said to have been founded by Patarus, P-A-T-A-R-U-S, Patarus, a son of the god Apollo. And this village of Patara became an annex of Rome in 43 AD. And students of the Bible will recognize the name Patara from the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 1, as the place where the Apostle Paul changed ships on one of his missionary journeys. So I want to tell you about a man who was born in the Roman outpost of Patara or Patara in the year 270 of the common era. And this man was born to wealthy Greek parents. So he was Greek by blood, Roman by political rule and Christian by faith in early Catholic tradition. 
All Fridays of the year were days of penance, meaning a day of voluntary sacrifice for the sins you have committed. And all persons who were age 14 and older were also bound by the law of abstinence on all Fridays, which means that they were to refrain from eating meat. And this is how we got to the fish on Fridays or the Friday fish fry routine that so many of us are familiar with today. And all Catholics who were between the ages of 18 and 60 were bound as well by the early church law of fasting on both Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, meaning that adherents were to limit the quantity of food that they ingested on those days. And it is written that the man whose story I am now telling you, he was known to be very religious at an early age, and he rigorously observed those canonical fasts on Wednesdays and Fridays. And while this man was still very young, his rich parents died in a disease epidemic, and he was sent to live with and to be raised by his uncle, with whom he shared the same first name. And his uncle was the Bishop of Patera, or Patara the town in which he, the nephew, had been born. And it was under the tutelage of this bishop uncle that our young man became a reader in the church, and eventually he became a priest. And as a youth, this young man I'm telling you about, he made a pilgrimage to Egypt and to Palestine. And on the way, as the story goes, he set sail on an Egyptian ship. And the first night, he had a dream that a fierce storm would rise up and put them all in peril at sea. And when he woke up the next morning, he warned the sailors that there was a severe storm on the horizon, and he comforted them, saying, God will protect us. And at the same time he was telling them this, the sky darkened, and strong winds began to blow, and the ship started to violently and uncontrollably list back and forth, back and forth. And nearly everyone on board feared for their lives. And terrified, they gathered around this man who had dreamed of this storm and who had warned them that it was coming. They now begged this same man to pray for their safety, that they would survive the storm. And as the story goes, one sailor climbed up the main mast to tighten the rope so the mast wouldn't come crashing down on top of them all. And as this sailor was coming back down, he slipped and fell to the deck and he was killed. And this man whose story I'm now telling you, he stepped in to pray over the dead sailor's body. And as he did, the storm quieted and fear left the other sailors and they became calm, yet still grief stricken because their fallen comrade lay dead before them on the deck. And as this man prayed over the dead sailor, he was at once revived as if he had only been asleep the whole time. That's one of the legendary stories told about this man. From the ages of 42 to 45, this man lived in a cave on a mountain overlooking Bethlehem, and he went on a pilgrimage, sojourning to the many sacred sites throughout the land. At age 47, he returned to his native homeland in what was then called Asia Minor and is now known as modern-day Turkey. And this man eventually became a Christian bishop in an ancient city called Myra, M-Y. R.A. Myra, not too far from where he was born in the town of Patara or Patara. And as the Christian religion threatened to overthrow or usurp traditional Roman religion in the first four centuries of the common era, the persecution of Christians under Roman rulers thrived. It was rampant. And as decreed by Roman Emperor Diocletian, many Christian leaders were arrested and tortured and tried and imprisoned and executed. Some were burned alive at the stake. And our Catholic Bishop of Myra, man whose story I am now telling, it is written that he was imprisoned for five years during this time of great persecution of the Christian church. When Roman Emperor Constantine I also known to many of us as Constantine the Great, when Constantine invited 1,800 Christian bishops from throughout all of the provinces of his very vast empire to the city of Nicaea in 325, the bishop of Myra, our dude, answered that request. And the 6th century text called the Index of Theodorus Lector is the first known document to list him as the 151st delegate at the First Council of Nicaea. 
And many of us know that the First Council of Nicaea was the first effort by the Catholic Church to attain consensus on specific technical details of Christian doctrine and to resolve disagreements among various factions of Christianity on the doctrines they were teaching and preaching throughout the Roman Empire. Another outcome of the First Council of Nicaea was the Nicene Creed. N-I-C-E-N-E, the Nicene Creed, C-R-E-E-D, the Nicene Creed, which is a profession of faith that to this day in some form is still used by many churches in the Christian tradition. You may know a variation of that as the Apostles Creed. Some people read that in church as well. Now, the word Catholic means universal. How many of y'all knew that? word Catholic means universal. So the first council of Nicaea in 325 was the Catholic church's attempt to formally universalize the Christian doctrine. And the man whose story I'm telling was there in attendance in 325 at the first council of Nicaea. And he is perhaps most famous for this story. It is written that there was once a poor man who had three daughters and he could not afford a proper dowry for any of them. A dowry is a purse paid by a bride to her husband on their marriage. And because these three daughters had no dowry, it meant that they would probably, back in that time, remain unmarried. And as such, might end up on the stripper pole or the equivalent of it in ancient times or some other form of public prostitution. Or at least people would think that about them since they were of a certain age and remain unmarried. So when the Bishop of Myra, this is our dude, when he heard about this poor man and his three daughters, he decided to help them. But because of his modesty, he didn't want to outright offer them help in public because he didn't want them to feel humiliation like they were a charity case or something. So this man went to their house under the cover of darkness and he threw into an open window on the upper floor three purses, three purses filled with gold coins, one for each of the unmarried daughters. That's another of the legendary stories told about this man. And the name of this man that I have been telling you all about, his name is, his name was Nicholas. And he is known the world over as St. Nicholas or St. Nick. St. Nicholas died at the age of 73 in the year 343 AD in the city of Myra, where he was, as I said, the bishop. And there is even one extant E-X-T-A-N-T, extant, which means surviving. There's one surviving text written in his own hand that is still in the care of the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, also known as the head bishop in Jerusalem. Now, the bones of St. Nicholas were stolen from Myra in 1087 by Italian merchants. And those relics are now venerated in the Basilica St. Nicola in the town of Bari, Italy, B-A-R-I, Italy. And as Christianity further developed and as early church fathers became revered as saints after their deaths, the relics or the remains of these monks and bishops became tourist attractions wherever they were housed. And those cities began to rely on these tourist attractions to stimulate their local economy. So that's how a man who was born and served his whole life as a bishop in what is now the country of Turkey, that's how his relics ended up in Italy today because he's a tourist attraction. And Italy is not all that interested in returning those relics to Turkey, even though the Turkish government has since requested them back. Now, the Archdiocese of Bari in Italy has over the years allowed for one scientific survey of the bones of St. Nicholas. In the 1950s, during a restoration of the chapel, the Catholic Church allowed a team of hand-picked scientists to photograph and measure the contents of the crypt or the grave of St. Nicholas. And in the summer of 2005, the report of these measurements was sent to a forensic laboratory in England. And a review of the data revealed that the historical St. Nicholas was five feet, six inches tall, and he had a broken nose, which was probably suffered during the great persecution I spoke of earlier. Now, the facial recognition of St. Nicholas was produced by Dr. Caroline Wilkinson at the University of Manchester in England. And that facial reconstruction of St. Nicholas was revealed on a BBC Two documentary called The Real Face of Santa. 
The Real Face of Santa, BBC Two documentary, 2005. Look that up, brothers and sisters. And what you will see is a face that looks very different than most of the popular icons of St. Nicholas that the world has been shown. So look that up and you can see as close as we're probably ever going to get to seeing what Brother St. Nicholas actually looked like. When the Dutch West India Company established the colony of New Netherland in 1624, the settlers, of course, brought with them to the New World their own customs and traditions. Among them, the legend of Sinterklaas, S-I-N-T-E-R. K-L-A-A-S, Center Claus. And in the Dutch tradition, the Feast of Center Claus celebrates the life and legacy of the historical figure St. Nicholas on December 6th each year. And on the night before, which is December 5th, gift giving takes place. So on the eve of St. Nicholas Day, gifts are exchanged. And the Dutch depict Center Claus as an elderly man with white hair and a long full beard wearing a long red cape and traditionally riding a white horse and carrying in his hand a big red book in which is written whether each child has been good or naughty in the past year. And here's where it gets really interesting, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully. Also in the Dutch tradition, Center Claus, again that's S I N T E R K L A A S, Center Claus is assisted by mischievous helpers with black faces and colorful Moorish dresses. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the word Moorish, it comes from the word Moor, M O O R. And for purposes of this conversation, I'm going to refer to the 16th century scholar Leo Africanus, Leo Africanus, who identified the Moors as the native Berber, B-E-R-B-E-R, Berber, inhabitants of the former Roman African province. So the Moors were African people. And Brother Leo Africanus further described the Moors as one of the five main population groups on continental Africa, alongside the Egyptians and the Abyssinians, also known as the Ethiopians and the Arabs and the Kafri, C-A-F. R-I or Kafete, C-A-F-A-T-E-S. And that is a not so nice way of indicating a group of African people who are dark skinned. In their legend, Center Claus is assisted by mischievous helpers with black faces and colorful 16th century Moorish dresses. And these figures are called Zwarte Piet. Zwarte Piet. Z-W-A-R-T-E. Zwarte Piet. P-I-E-T, Zwarte Piet, which means Black Pete. And these are Santa Claus's helpers in the Dutch tradition, which dates back to the early 19th century. Now, these Black helpers of Santa Claus are typically depicted carrying a bag, which contains candy for the children, which the Zwarte Piet toss out into the crowds wherever they go. And this tradition dates back to the days of St. Nicholas, saving those three poor girls from prostitution by tossing gold coins through their window at night to pay their dowries. Now, the bags carried by Santa Claus's black helpers, the ones with the candy and the little gingerbread cookies that they throw out into the crowds, the tradition goes that naughty children would be put into those bags carried by the Zwarte Piet, the Black Pete's, and those bad kids would be sent back to Spain. Well, why Spain? Now, this is part of the legend that refers back to a time between the 16th and 18th centuries to the Barbary Coast, B-A-R-B-A-R-Y, to the Barbary slave trade, when Moorish pirates from Spain raided the northern coasts of Africa, acquiring European slaves. So these black helpers of Santa Claus are pointing back to and remembering that time in Dutch history when the dark-skinned Moors enslaved Europeans. And so in today's Dutch Santa Claus tradition, the Zwarte Piet play the role of the Moors, threatening to send naughty children back to Spain to become their slaves. Now, all of this is playing out in the annual Dutch Santa Claus celebration, which they still do in full blackface to this very day in the Netherlands. And these are the cultural nuggets the Old World Dutch brought to New Amsterdam, also known today as Manhattan, New York City. These are the seeds of tradition the Dutch brought over with them. Now, during the Reformation in 16th and 17th century Europe, many Protestants changed the gift bringer 
from St. Nicholas to Jesus, the Christ child, or the Christkindle, or the Christkind, Christkindle, C-H-R-I-S-T-K-I-N-D-L, Christkindle. And if you listen very closely to that word, Christkindle, you will begin to hear the Americanized corruption of that German name that is part of our present day traditional Christmas story of Chris Kringle, Chris Kringle. Chris Kindle, Chris Kind. In 1810, American merchant and philanthropist John Pintard, P I N T A R D, John Pintard, published a pamphlet proposing St. Nicholas as the patron saint of New York City. In 1812, writer Washington Irving revised his book, A History of New York, including in the new version a dream sequence featuring St. Nicholas soaring over treetops in a flying wagon. And these literary works by Pintard and Irving contributed to the revival of the Dutch tradition of Santa Claus and led to a reinterpretation of the old world celebration reimagined as the American Christmas tradition of Santa Claus that is still practiced in the United States today. And if you're interested in knowing more about the Dutch tradition of Santa Claus, you can read the book St. Nicholas and His Servant by Jan Schenkman. St. Nicholas and His Servant by Jan Schenkman. S-C-H-E-N-K-M-A-N. Jan Schenkman. Nicholas and His Servant first published in 1850. So, from a very wealthy and religious boy named Nicholas, born in a small town in Turkey, who grew up to be a man known for his random acts of kindness and secret gift-giving, who was venerated after his death as St. Nicholas, to the celebrated Old World Dutch annual remembrances of his life and spiritual work, to the New World, American fairy tale of a jolly old man who flies across the sky in a sleigh led by a reindeer who comes down the chimney each year with gifts for good children. That, brothers and sisters, is the origin story of just a part, just a piece of our collective American Christmas tradition. 